Welcome everyone to the 17th session of the Fireside Chat with Tom Campbell. Um, we have some questions today that are very diverse and uh, very interesting. Uh, future, very light subjects such as the future of our civilization, free will versus determinism, Carl Jung's experiments and imagination, and the ever popular out of body experiences. So let's get started. First question comes from an MBT forum user. Um, from his explorations of the probable future database, can you say, Tom, whether a major collapse of our civilization is likely in the near future due to increasing problems with the interrelated uh, energy, economy, ecology? Are we on the brink of a new dark age and a population crash? Well, I don't look for those sorts of things. I don't, um, you know, I don't know, how can I say this to make it sound like it's uh, like it's plausible because people would think, well, why, why wouldn't you look for those kinds of things if that was available and that's something everybody would want to know? But the answer to that question is no, that's not really a very interesting subject for me. Um, so I don't I don't look at that, but yes, you could find some information on those subjects if you if you wished. Uh, I'd be very skeptical about it because there's a lot of a lot of fear based around those subjects, and then it, if fear is part of what's going on in your mind or in your feelings or at your being level as you talk about these things, then you're going to distort the the uh, the information that you get you're going to end up with information that is is mirroring that fear as opposed to information that's just there so in, in general i don't look at what's happening in the future because it's just not that important the idea is whatever happens will happen and what's important is how you deal with it at the time that it happens not really that you can you know know what's going to happen ahead of time so it's just not that important. And you think, well, but if I knew ahead of time, maybe I'd move to high ground or, uh, you know, avoid being in the in the disaster zone or something, you know, it might save my life. But all in all, that's really not all that important either. You see, so you just, uh, it's just not something that is, is worth getting into because of all the fear that's surrounding it. If you were to tell somebody else about it, chances are they would connect to it with their fear more than anything else. Uh, so, I don't know, there's just, I just don't see much point in it. So I don't go there, I don't look for that, and uh, don't really have much interest in it. The best thing to do is take life as it comes, deal with it in the way that's most profitable for you to deal with it, and don't worry too much about what the future brings. So it's, it's an unimportant thing to, to worry about. Okay, Tom, well, you also said, well, this is a digital reality, and these things that evolve, um, the system can override. They, these things are not simply a set in stone situation. Different right. things can right. affect it. Is that right? Nothing, yeah, nothing in the future is set in stone. Everything in the future is just probability. Uh, some have higher probabilities than others, but it's just probability. And after all, the, the whole simulation is is uh, digital, as you say, and can be, you know, there are digital solutions to these problems. Let's lay some kind of big massive things going to happen, like all the volcanoes in the world are all going to spout off at the same time and create such an ash cloud that nothing will grow for another 50 years and no vegetation and all the animals, everything dies because vegetation is the, is the root of all the food sources you know, on the planet, and that's going to happen for, you know, 50 years, the planet won't have any, you know, won't have uh, anything but the very simplest of life forms in it. So we could, we could imagine that. And if that's what's going to happen, and if that wasn't a very good plan for the larger consciousness system, because we wouldn't have this, this little uh, learning lab here available anymore, then the larger consciousness system could just prevent that from happening. Because after all, this is a simulation. You see, so things could be adjusted in the margins where nobody would notice, where there's lots of uncertainty, like the amount of pressure that's going on at, you know, 20 miles below the surface of the planet and so on, things that nobody could tell that there was any 
any uh, interference in the natural way of things going on. So the system could obviate those kinds of difficulties if it wanted to. It may not want to, but anyway, it could. And if something like that happened, the system could always, if it went ahead and let it happen just to see how that would play out, it could always do a checkpoint restart. It could go back, you know, 50 years and start over again. And this time make the proper adjustments so that didn't happen. So the system can fix those kinds of things. That's why I say it's just not that important. We'll get along the best we can. We'll interact with the things that happen. We'll make our best decisions. And that's it. You know, and if this particular uh, simulation be, uh, you know, ha is having technical difficulties, and goes offline and is no longer available, well, there's lots of other virtual realities out there that we could inhabit and make choices and grow up just the same too. So the system has lots of choices and we will always have choices as well. So it's not like anything that you can imagine that happens here in the physical world is going to be the end of everything. It's not, this is just a virtual reality. It's a simulation and even if it goes away, it's not the end of any, anything, really. We're consciousness. We still survive all of that, and we can still incarnate in any other kind of virtual reality that is suitable for us. So it's just not a big thing to worry about or to be concerned with. You just, you know, what's important is how do you make, you know, how do you make the choices when you have to deal with things? When things come up you have to deal with, how do you deal with it? How do you make those choices? What's the quality of your choice? That's what's important. And you do that right up until the time that things change, you know, whether uh, this avatar gives out and you start over with another avatar or, you know, the whole simulation goes out and you start out in a new simulation or you start out in a, re, you know, in a, in a, in a kind of a refurbished version of this. However that works out is just not that important. And it's, what do they say? You know, it's not at my pay grade or it's not at my level. You know, those kinds of decisions are made elsewhere. And uh, uh, if your input is needed, you will be asked. <laughs> so otherwise, just uh, keep on keeping on and learning your lessons and growing up. And that's the best thing that you can do. And since fear is attached to these things, getting into the subject and, and getting a, a conversation going on this subject will do more harm than good because it'll just create fear because most people can't deal with this subject without fear because they're still focused on 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 i on me what's going to happen to me what's going to happen to mine and how do i protect that and it gets into a uh, it, it tends to get into a, a negative cycle rather than a positive one uh, tom i wanted to ask you uh based on, on what you were saying um i mean everybody understands that this is you know, whatever's going to be is going to be. It just is what it is. So you just take it as it comes. Obviously, this, right. this is not the end. Whatever's, you know, all these types of predictions or whatever, it's, you know, kind of futile to, to bother with it. But I was just kind of curious, you know, we have talked before, like, uh, you know, consciousness leads and the body follows or consciousness leads and PMR follows, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had, you know, evidential experiences of healing, of uh, manifesting things, you know, things that I could actually put my hands around. Now, if you have groups of people who focus on healing or, you know, um, as opposed to, let's say, me just, you know, focusing on trying to, you know, make the green light turn a little faster when I need it to or something like that. If you have groups of people who are focusing on healing, they could do a lot more things and manifest a lot more things. So if you have uh, people who have been, let's say, indoctrinated because, you know, if their intent, let's say, is being hijacked, okay, so they're uh, being indoctrinated to believe certain things that are not true, let's say, and uh, now their intent is, you know, let's say a large, let's say a billion people, or, you know, their large group of people, their intent has been hijacked, so now they're all believing certain things. What is the um, the extent of which the uh, the reality? As it's you know it's not rendered completely you know in the entire universe or you know it's rendered as it needs to be rendered based on the probability and beliefs and intents mm -hmm. and all that stuff. What is the extent of the rule set of this PMR reality being changed based on P 
people being indoctrinated into belief systems and having their intent hijacked and all of those people, as opposed to let's say, say just me healing one person or manifesting a shopping cart or, you know, and putting it in that light where you have a billion people who are unknowingly indoctrinated into a belief system and their intent has been hijacked unconsciously to focus on this belief type of what can be done, let's say by nefarious power structures, let's say. Okay. Well, first let's talk about its effect. So let's say, and, and we'll kind of bring this last, you know, this last question into that. Um, let's say that we have, uh, you know, a billion or two or three billion people who are uh, uh, indoctrinated into a philosophy that uh, the end is near and, uh, you know, the, the great uh, cataclysm is about to happen. And for whatever, for whatever reason, they all believe this. Okay that then would make that eventuality more likely. That would raise the probability of that. Again, we affect the probable future with our intent. So if you have billions of people that see a very gloomy future and they put their intentional energy into that gloomy future, then the probability of a gloomy future gets higher. Okay, and if you have a lot of people who you know do not put their energy into that sort of thing or put their energy into a very positive future, then a very positive future has a higher probability. So it's a matter of modifying probability. Yes, uh, large groups of people can be hijacked and I suppose we'd, we'd probably fault religion for the for a lot of that hijacking. Uh, we could probably fault a lot of the uh, conspiracy theory that runs around on, a, on the web for some of that hijacking as well. Um, but uh, sure, this reality is what we we make it to be. We are the uh, we're not the sole creator, but we're co-creators. We have input into the nature of how this reality is going to be. So that's that's a fact. And sometimes um, things that um, you know things that would be uh, we might think as as big uh, global catastrophes may be a reflection of some of that negativity that we see in the world because that's part of what we're doing we create an environment that's that uh, is very challenging in in uh, perhaps negative ways when we are a negative people so it's all it is all connected well, but that that's I another, understand. another yeah. reason why that's another reason why the best thing you can do about it is get positive get rid of your own fear you know get rid of your your ego because as we do that, then we're adding to the solution rather than just sitting on the sidelines. Now that I, you know, that I get, but the heart of the, my question was to what extent can the, can the structure of the rule sets of the reality be changed based on a belief and intent that pushes through? In other words, for argument's sake, let's just say um, everybody believes that the floor of the ocean is all made of sand and rock or whatever. So I'm using a kind of a crazy analogy here. And let's say, but, and if people are being um, hijacked, so to speak, in their intent to believe that, let's say, the ocean is, uh, I mean, the, the base of the ocean is, I don't know, jello. I don't know. I don't, you know. So to what extent can the rule sets of the reality be changed based on our consciousness, our conscious intent? pushing okay. into the reality to create the reality. I mean, I understand what you were saying before. I'm just talking about the actual structure of the rule sets. How much wiggle room is there? Like say, if, if you and me and a few other people got together and we focused to change a random generator to two, plus or minus two or 3%, that's within the realm of possibility. But I'm saying as far as to what extent can the actual rule sets be okay. actually modified or changed? Okay. The rule set is not going to be changed much if, at all. The rule set is the fundamental set of rules that, that which the simulation is based on. Now, that rule set may have 10 or 20 different ways that it can express itself. That rule set may be able to express itself and at the bottom of the ocean is all like a sandy beach. There's no rocks on it at all. It's just a, you know, a plane of, uh, of bright, you know, of white sand. That is a possibility within the rule set. Now, that may not be highly likely because there's other factors involved that would say, well, there's probably some rocks there and some other things going on. All white sand is, is not really highly likely. 
but it's a possibility. And there may be a hundred other possibilities of the way it could be. Now, within those possibilities, intent can modify which ones, you know, if when we go down and take the picture, when we go down and look at what's on the bottom of the ocean, okay, there's a lot of uncertainty there because that's not a thing we get to look at very often. So if that's the first time anybody's looked at it, they look at it, they get something that comes out of the probability distribution. Now, if those probabilities have been changed by intent, then they may get something a little different. So it's not that the rule set changes, but that the various possibilities within that rule set are changed based on intent. The rule set itself isn't going to change much because that's what this reality is based on. You change the rule set very much, and this reality may not hold together, may not become, you know, may not stay stable. So it, it's not that the that like chemistry changes suddenly, uh, you know, a hydrogen atom has three electrons, or uh, you know, a hydrogen atom has two protons, or something. Just change the rule set. Well, that's going to change. The very basic fiber of the way the the uh, um, the reality is computed. So I'd say you're not changing the rule set, but you're changing the the possibilities, the outcomes. There's lots of different possibilities that the rule set can support, and the ones we have our intent uh, focused on are the ones that become more probable. So it's that sort of thing. So uh, it, the probably that there's jello on the bottom of the ocean. It's probably zero as far as the rule set goes. There's, there's probably no way that could work. So there's nothing in the rule set that's going to change to make that happen. But the fact that there's more rocks or less rocks or the sand is more white or less white or any number of 100 different things that could change or that it's deeper than we thought or not as deep as we thought or that there's critters down there that we've never seen before and that kind of thing. All of that is within the rule set that we've got. And it can change what we actually discover when we go there will be a matter of, of taking random draws out of probability distributions of all the possibilities. And of course, if the, pos if the probability is higher, then it's more likely that that random draw will pick a higher probability. That's the nature of probability distributions. So that's, you know, I don't know if I've got your question uh, answered there, but I don't think the rule set itself will change. I think that um, the way the rule set is is uh, expressed in our physical reality can change. Based they on can. I mean, the rules can be broken. For example, I mean, if you use strong enough intent, and you know, you're going to kind of break or bend the rules. You can do that right. within the you know, the, the psi uncertainty principle. But if enough people are intending on, let's say, breaking the rules, let's say for argument's sake that someone wants to buy locate and they're going to you're trying to do it in a I don't know, uh, in a public place or something. I mean, you're going to have the restraints from the system holding you down, but that focused intent, if it's a continued focused intent, whether it's one person or extra amounts of people, they should be able to continually put pressure on the system to bend. They, to their, they, you know, they may consistently put system uh, pressure on the system to bend that rule, but the system does not have to give in. If the system you know, says that's a bad idea, you know, that's what sci science certainty principle basically says. That's counterproductive. That's going to create more harm than good. Then the system does not have to, you know, allow that uh, that breakage. It's if it's one person alone in their room. Well, then that's different. There's not a lot of downside to that, you see. But if it's uh, you know Jello on the bottom of the sea, uh, particularly if it's you know raspberry Jello or uh, you know something like that, or pink elephants flying around in the atmosphere. You know that kind of thing. They would probably say that's going to do more breaking, create more fear, more problems than it is going to do anything else. So the how resilient is the system? It, but it wouldn't yield. But how resistant? Let's say, for example, uh, when I'm driving and you know, and I'm using my intent to get the, the green light to go a little quicker, just for my own convenience. If, if I'm in a rush or something like that, and the mm -hmm. system seems to kind of let that slide very often. Whereas opposed to what? How? I mean, how much? Um, does the system at some point yield to you if you're, can, if, if you're, you know, not, obviously that's a simple manifestation thing, yeah. but like uh, something that's a very difficult thing to do if a group of people or, you know, and I'm just kind of, you know, extrapolating at this, 
how much does the system, you know, does it get to the point where the system's like, this is not happening and that's it? Or will the it system depends. yield to you? Yeah, Mike, it depends on the uncertainty in the system. You see, if, if you have, if there's a lot of uncertainty in the system, like that green light, you know, whether it changes, uh, you know, three seconds earlier or three seconds later, eh, nobody notices. There's a lot of uncertainty in the drivers and all the people that are aware of that light. Nobody's sitting there with a stopwatch timing it, you know, to the nearest half second. So there's a lot of uncertainty. It's just when that light's going to change and there's no one monitoring it. So in that case, it's easy for you or other people to modify that. And the modification doesn't show up as anything extra normal. Okay, so it's, it's, it's buried in the uncertainty of the situation. To have, uh, you know, pink elephants flying around in the atmosphere, now there you have, you know, we have a, we, we don't have a lot of uncertainty about that. We're very certain that that's not going to happen, that the bottom of the ocean is not made out of jello. And we say that's impossible. Our rule set doesn't allow that. So there's very little uncertainty there. That means it's very hard to make that happen. Yes, you can put pressure on it, but it's unlikely that it will ever happen because it's, you are, you know, the odds are so far against you. So let's say it's one in a hundred billion that that'll happen. Well, you've got a lot of motion to do with your intent to move something that many decimal places. You see, you're just not going to do it, even if you have a billion people working on it. It's just not likely. So the, the degree to which you can move, uh, the probability of what happens has to do with the uncertainty that surrounds that natural thing. So if you want something that is terribly uncertain to become a reality, then that will take a lot more force and there may not be any force that can, that can do that because the uncertainty may be so great. Matter of fact, if the uncertainty is, is, is extremely large, you know, that the probability goes to zero, then you can multiply any big number you want into zero and you still have zero. So that's, see, that's the problem. So if you pick something that's just totally impossible by the rule set and the uncertainty of whether or not it happened, in other words, the, the problem that it will cause in the, in the uh, virtual reality, it will be a discontinuity within the virtual reality. And that's known by large numbers of people. That's a problem. So we got two different problems there. It's just the, it's the natural uncertainty and then, of course, the, the uh, psi uncertainty principle. So between those two things, that kind of boxes in, gives you the limitations on what you can change and how much you can change it by. So if you want to levitate in your bedroom at night, that's one thing. But if you levitate in front of a lot of cameras, you know, on, on a, a world news program, that's a different kind of thing. It's a, and it, then it, for that matter, it depends on whether that levitation, is that going to build up your ego? or not. If that's going to be a big ego builder for you, then that probably won't happen either, even in the privacy of your own bedroom, you see. So there's lots of limitations that are put on these kinds of ideas. So you can't just do anything, even if you have enough people doing it. Uh, there, are, there are limitations that the system puts on it. Yeah, I just thought it was just kind of, based on the question that that was, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there it just seemed because okay. is there a certain formula or uh based on how many people could counteract let's say an unconsciously indoctrinated belief systems of a group of people's intent that they're being like a, a an intent that's being hijacked is there some form of formula that you have to say how many people of conscious intent could um nullify a an intent or belief that's destructive no, I don't think there's any kind of formula. I think the system is a smart system. You know, it's an intelligent system. I think it looks at each situation as a unique situation and decides whether it's a good thing or not such a good thing. Decides, uh, you know, there's this much uncertainty is going to cause this much trouble, or uh, we could we could do this and it would have a good. It wouldn't, uh, you know, it wouldn't create any trouble and it would actually create some good and it would allow that. I think it's a situation by situation. Now it may have some some statistics that it gathers to help it make its decision, but I have no idea what those, what those would be. 
Yeah, the best thing to do is just let things just be and not worry about it. Just yeah. The system, the system will take care of itself, and that's it. That's the simple that's answer. It. <laughs> that's basically the simple answer. The system will take care of itself, and you just do do your part to grow up as best you can, and then everything else, you kind of let the chips fall where they may. Well, I think that's a good place to uh, end the, the discussion on this, Tom, and we'll move on to the next question. Uh, we have a question from Peter on the MBT forum. In your MBT model, humans are basically described as a data set of information that reflects all their traits, preferences, and previous experiences, plus a component that allows free will choices based on the data set. At least parts of these preferences, for example, things we like or hate seem to be predetermined before we can really make a conscious choice about them. Do we set up these preferences before we start our incarnation, or where do they come from? Does this predetermined set of preferences include a special intent on what we want to achieve in this life? Well, um, the, the part that's creating the confusion on this, on this particular question is uh, kind of shown in the, in the part of the question where it said uh, that we seem to have these, these um, attitudes or this proclivity toward choices even before we have a chance to make a conscious you know understanding or, or conscious uh, effort well that's not true that that's we that's the little we that that's we the uh the uh, free will awareness unit perhaps but we the individuated unit of consciousness has been making these choices for lifetimes and life you know lifetimes and lifetimes and when you come yes you do come with some uh, preconceived uh, attitudes, I guess. You come with a certain uh, potential toward fear, a certain potential toward ego, because you represent the being level of that individuated unit of consciousness that, that you are, that spawns you, if you will, that spawns the free will awareness unit. So you don't uh, come in perfectly uh, fearless and no ego and whatever, and then build all that stuff up, you come in as a, represent, as a representation of the quality of the individuated unit of consciousness that you are, you see? And that's everything that's been collected. That's all the learning that's been learned, uh, all the fear that's been dropped, but it's also all the fear that's been retained and all the ego that's been retained. It's, it's all of that. And you come in as an expression of that and those things aren't generally precise. It's not like you come in with a fear of snakes or a fear of uh, you know, that kind of a thing. That's not unheard of, but it's not generally likely. It usually would have other, other reasons for that. But you come in with a potential to, to uh, gravitate towards certain things. And that potential is, what is the potential you just start with. And the whole idea is you start from wherever you are and you increase the quality of that consciousness in this lifetime of the choices you make. But you don't start at the, you know, at the very beginning, you don't start at the end, you start wherever it is your individuated unit of consciousness happens to have earned up to this point. So that's where a lot of those uh, uh, proclivities that we have, those potentials that we have come from. We start with them. And for those of you who are parents and have had young children, you realize that those young children come in with a, with a pretty full set of uh, personality traits and, and values and ideas right from when they're born. And if you, if you uh, keep track of that, you'll realize that then later when they're 25 or 45, they still are expressing many of the same traits they came in with as as babies that they obviously showed as, as one-year-olds and two-year-olds and three-year-olds and now they're 40-year-olds and they have fundamentally a lot of the same stuff that they came in with it's just been honed and repackaged and in many cases improved it's grown you know the quality is, has gone up some which is good but we do come in with a lot we don't come in as blank slates. We bring we bring a lot of our potential with us. 
Okay, Tom, the question has a second part to it. What is the source of our visions, and does that source also determine our feeling on how our life should be? Why are so many people unhappy with core parts of their life, like their partnership, the place they live, or their work? Okay, the reason that so many people are unhappy and so many people kind of see themselves as in a perpetual struggle, that everything in their life is a struggle, that's because they have a lot of fear and a lot of ego and a lot of beliefs. It's the fear, ego, and beliefs that make your life unhappy, make your life miserable, make your life into a struggle. So that's kind of the answer to that question. Um, what was the very first part of that, Donna? Uh, the first oh. part of that is what is the source of our visions and does that uh, source also a, determine our feeling about yeah, that's how our life should yeah, be? That's a little different. The source of our visions, and I'll take that to mean the source of kind of um, what we see, what we, uh, where, who we think we are, where we think we're going, what we think our path is. You know, I'll, I'll kind of translate visions as that, as opposed to just a specific vision of, of uh, a very specific thing. Yes, those, those visions uh, in that general sense are you know, an expression, again, of who we are at the being level. That's why we envision those things. That's, that's how we see the world, through our own filter. Our visions are a, are a filter of, of us. So those things can limit us. If we have limitations, then our visions are very limited. You know, some, some people are very big picture people. They tend to see things in terms of big picture ideas and big picture feelings. And other people are very focused on the little picture. They don't see big pictures. They don't notice big pictures. They just see, you know, they see only the biggest alligator that's closest to them. You know, only the struggle at hand. And they focus all their attention on that. And others, you know, see themselves not only surrounded by alligators, but, you know, they, they notice the swamp and, and the environs, and they have a whole lot bigger picture of what's going on besides just the challenges that are immediately in front of them. How do these challenges relate to everything else in their life and to, um, again, their, their visions and where they're going? So we are, we are limited by ourselves more than anything else. We come in with a certain uh, with a certain set of proclivities, and we are to improve ourselves while we're here. But we see everything through the filter of those proclivities, including our visions are are filtered by that, and that's our limitations. So our limitations then fundamentally are created by our fear and belief and ego, and only by getting rid of those things do we reduce those limitations. And as we grow up. Our, our decision space gets bigger. Our uh, life not only gets better, but it gets bigger and richer and broader. All right, thank you. The next question is on free will and determinism. And by the structure of it, I'm not sure I can do justice to it. So basically what he's saying is we appear to have free will um, for various reasons that he has uh, philosophized about. And his question, too, is, is the quality of our consciousness predetermined by this rule set? Is the quality of our consciousness predetermined uh, by, by our rule set? I'll take just that idea first. Um, the quality of our consciousness is what we're here to, to modify. It's what we're here to change. It's not predetermined, but it is it does come in with initial conditions, okay? And that's the initial conditions are what we've earned up to this point, the amount of quality we've created in our consciousness to the point where we take on this avatar. So we come in with those initial conditions and then what we do after that is our free will. We can actually improve that quality or we can disimprove it. We can evolve or de-evolve based on our free will choices. So we not only seem to have free will, we actually do have free will. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, an illusion. We get to make choices of the things that are in our decision space that we know about. So we, we have those choices. That doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. That doesn't mean that we don't have restrictions and limitations. It just means that we get to make the choices that are in front of us that we know are there. There are some of choices that we don't know 
that we have. We may have 100 choices. We only may be aware of 10 of them. So our free will lets us pick one of those 10, even though there's another 90 that uh, we just don't have a big enough picture to even realize our choices. Well, we've got those 10, and we have the free will to pick one of them. That's, that's what free will is, and it's an actual, it's an actual thing, not, a, uh, uh, not a, uh, an apparent thing. It's actually there. And it's there because of the amount of uncertainty that is in our reality. We have free will because we have a lot of our choices. We don't know where those choices will lead. We don't know what the results are. If we knew all of that, we wouldn't make, uh, we wouldn't be making choices. We'd be calculating the correct choice. You see, everything would be algorithmic at that point. If we knew everything of all the facts and all the possibilities and probabilities and everything that happened was known, then we could look at all that data and say, well, this is my best choice. All the rest of those aren't as good. And therefore we'd always make that one. Now we're being, re in that, in that sense, we're being reduced to a computer. A computer makes the choices that algorithms say are the best choice. You see, but we're not like that. We have uncertainty. And our free will choice in part depends on that uncertainty. Because there's uncertainty there, we don't know what choice is going to be the best choice. We think about it and we have some experience that helps us make decisions but we have to decide on, you know, what is the right thing to do? So it comes down to a, what's right, what's right action here, what's right intent. And then you do that and then it leads wherever it happens to lead. And then you deal with that wherever, wherever it leads, you have to also deal with and make choices. And because we don't know, because there's uncertainty that gives us the, the freedom, we have the freedom to choose. Otherwise it was algorithmic. There would, you know, our choices would all be kind of laid out in front of us. We could either be rational or irrational. We'd only have one choice, just uh, irrational or irrational. But as it is, we've got a whole bunch of rational choices because um, all of them could end up being good or bad choices. But we make it the best we can. And if that's a good choice to the side of caring, as opposed to a poor choice toward the side of, of uh, fear, then we grow up. So you see, it's not in the outcome of the choice isn't where the value is. The value is in, in the intent behind the choice. That choice that we make turns out badly. That's not the point. The point is, is did we make the choice from a position of caring or love, or did we make the choice as a, from a position of fear? It's how we make that choice that's the key thing, not so much the end point or what happens next. That's not the, the you know, morality isn't tagged to the action, it's tagged to the intent behind the action. All right, our next question is from John on imagination. When we imagine images, what is this and where does it come from? We can close our eyes and imagine anything. Also, we can look at something, say a road, and imagine a car driving down the road if our, mind, our mind's eye superimposes an image over the road. Also, we can imagine things we've never seen before. Is this data being sent to our avatar at our request? from the larger consciousness system or the big computer or do we as consciousness create it ourselves from nothing okay the answer to that is both as consciousness we can create information that's part of what we do we express ourselves in terms of information and we can create data the larger system of consciousness can also create information and send it to us and we receive that data in exactly the same way, no matter where it comes from, wherever that data comes from, all we get is the data. See, that's all we see. So we make it up out of our, of our own consciousness, self-created, that we get as data. It comes from the larger conscious system, that we get as data, and it looks exactly the same. It comes from some other entity, you know, besides ourselves, it comes from, you know, our next door neighbor or, you know, because we're all netted or it comes from some consciousness that's out in the non-physical or whatever. We see that as data and all the data looks exactly alike. It doesn't have a special tag on it that says, oh, this is the data you made up. Oh, and this is the data 
from the larger consciousness system. I know this is your data from your friend, who you know, whoever who's who's in the larger consciousness system, and this is the data from your guide. You don't get tags that tell you what the source is. All you get is the data. You never get the source of the data. Okay, that's just the way it works. Data comes in, you deal with it. Have no idea where the source is. That's why you must always be skeptical because the source is unknown. So you, where, how do you know which is which? You don't ever really know for sure, but you do eventually learn to separate different sources of data just from your experience. But now this isn't certain. You don't know for sure that you've got it right because you're just taking the data you've got and from that data you're coming to conclusions and assumptions that may or may not be right, but you get more and more confidence in them as you deal with these various sources of data over decades. It takes time to be able to separate them. So, and the way you separate them is just very practically. The data that I get, you know, that, that's of this type and kind in these situations always turns out to be, you know, very valuable data or very true data. You can count on it. And data that I get in this kind of situation and so on is often flaky. Sometimes it's good data, sometimes it's not. So you, you get to be sensitive to, to the, the feel and the type and the sense of, of um, the data that's coming in. And even though you don't know the source for sure, you get to have more confidence in some data than you do in other data. And that's just out of your experience. And you can always be wrong. So you're always skeptical on what you get and where it comes from. But yes, we make up data. We are a source of data that we get. And uh, we also get data from outside ourselves. It's, you know, so there's part of your, part of your reality is self-created because you're listening to your own data. Part of it comes from elsewhere. And only experience will enable you to sometimes make intelligent guesses about which is which. Okay, Tom, continuing on uh, with the subject of um, imagination, uh, Ingeborg has a question for you um, resulting from a workshop she attended using Carl Jung's techniques of imagination. Um, the results for her were interesting in that it highlighted how respective subjective realities differed. Um, for her own sake, uh, doing this uh, exercise, um, she interacted with a multidimensional being and her question is evolves around how to develop a further relationship with this being. Can you give her any advice on this? Sure. First of all, let's kind of get an idea of what is a being. Okay? If we interact with something that interacts with us, in other words, we get information back, we're trading information, we're getting a data stream, and that data stream seems to be interactive. Well, that defines a being. Now, let's go back to our previous question and say, we've got lots of data coming from various data streams. And instead of worrying about, well, was this an external data stream or an internal data stream? That was a, that's a question that's really not a very good question to ask. The question you wanna ask, is this data exchange useful or is this data exchange not so useful? That's the question you want to ask. A lot of reasons for that. If, if you want to vet the, the uh, data based on the source, you will, you will be uh, treading on very um, thin ice there that's liable to, uh, to create problems. But if you vet the information, by vet it, I mean if you, if you um, analyze it and decide whether it's, it's good or bad, uh, based upon how useful it is, what do you learn? What are you getting out of it? Then that is a much better way to do that. So how do you get, so let's say we have this interaction. It doesn't matter exactly where it comes from. It matters about an interaction. It seems like an interesting interaction. It seems like we might learn something from it. 
So we would like to continue it. We'd like to uh, you know, do it again and again. That is probably the easiest part of this. All you have to do is have an intent in your mind to connect with that particular entity, individual, source, whatever it is. And when you reach out for that source, that source will be there. You will connect to that source. Remember, all individuated units of consciousness are netted. Okay, so it's like whenever you uh, click on a particular, whenever you put a particular URL in your web browser and then hit enter, you will get that web browser. You, you're calling on that particular uh, web browser to respond. And it's the same in the larger conscious system. So you put out a, uh, a request, basically. You say, I want, to, I want to talk to, and you just bring up the conversation you had last time, that particular entity bring up that experience of interacting with that particular entity and you will connect again with that particular entity. Now, if you have problems of trying to worry over, is that really the entity or am I imagining that or whatever, you're going to get in the way. Let all that go. Just interact with the entity and make your judgment of, the, of it based on your value, the value of it of the interaction, not on, on uh, your, your idea of the source and where the source is. So that's why we, I call these, um, you know, these entities, think of the entity as a, you know, in terms of, of metaphor, all right? So you have an entity and this entity is, and now here's where the metaphor comes. It is uh, male, um, uh, you know, old soul has all these kinds of experiences, knows a lot about this and that, um, things that I'm interested in. And that's your metaphor then for that entity. The source is irrelevant. Go to that entity, go to that past connection, and it'll just start right up. So it's just that easy. You just like you, you're typing the URL into the browser and you hit click. In your mind, you just bring up that conversation you had and say, I want to reestablish that kind of that connection and there it will be just go and use it interact with it don't doubt it or judge it or or try to determine source just deal with that interface that you've got and then judge eventually how valuable is it and that you won't be able to judge until you've been in conversation and connection with it probably dozens and dozens of times then you will be able to see, what did I learn from this? And often you'll be surprised. The lesson isn't at all what you thought you learned. It's not so much in the content of the information as in the context of the interaction. The context of the interaction usually proves more educational than does the actual information gleaned uh, from that context. So. And that's not necessarily true. That's just kind of a, a typical thing. So often you won't even know what the value of it is until you've worked with it, you know, dozens and dozens of times for three or four or six months. If you work with it, say, daily for months, you'll have some idea of uh, where the value is. And often, it, like I say, it's within the context of the interaction as opposed to the actual details of the information itself. Sometimes not, but I'm just giving you the the case that's under the fat part of the curve, the way it is most of the time. Did that answer your question? Uh, um, no, I think I was, uh, I, I got uh, the, the opportunity to build up some device, I would say. I, I, I thought it was a sort of field potential uh, which I could develop or evolve. And so I was curious whether you, you might have some advice for me how to build up such a thing. Yes, I can give you some advice perhaps. Um, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, experiment, explore, always, you know, if you have an opportunity to make connections, make the connections, explore the connections. Where do they lead you? Where do they go? Often a connection you have is just a step to something else. It's not necessarily the end point. 
it's often just a step to somewhere else. So even if it doesn't uh, give you something special in itself, it may be a, a necessary step you have to take to get to the next place. So always explore. Yeah, be in a be in a state of of uh, of wonderment and of exploration all the time. So if you have any opportunity to connect, almost in any way, take it. It's like if you're if you're in that uh, if you're in that point consciousness state, and suddenly a portal opens in front of you, and you see this big circle of light, or a door, or a window. Don't just look at it and say, "Hmm, isn't that interesting?" That's an invitation. Go through it. You say, explore, go through that door, right? go through that window. Uh, just be open to exploring whatever it is that you can explore and seeing where that leads. And if it leads somewhere where you're getting some information or something that interests you, then go back and, and uh, explore that some more. See what else you might get there and see where else it might take you. See, see these adventures in the non-physical as explorations and you you explore you know you explore an area that you're in you get into a new area well just map that out explore it uh, ask every question you can connect with whatever you can connect with learn whatever you can learn and it invariably will take you to someplace else and all of this is then part of your learning to settle your consciousness and and be able to communicate and let go of the ego and the fear from interacting you learn this stuff by doing not by thinking about it or following rules or prescription but by doing so the more you do the more you interact the more you explore the better you will get at exploring and the more you will get out of it so it, the game just gets richer and richer the more you go into it so Yes, always, always explore whatever opportunity you have. If it turns out very badly, well, then you can always back out of it. You have free will. You get to make the choices. So you can choose to pursue or you can choose to leave it alone. But um, I've always taken the attitude that if there's something out there that I might get something from, then it's worth my time to pursue it. And sometimes you don't get much. But sometimes what doesn't seem to be much at all now actually learns, you know, le uh, leads to someplace else very valuable. And you never would have gotten to that someplace else if you hadn't gone to the first one first. So being open minded to everything, but being very skeptical of everything is the way to travel. So, yes, go explore it all connect to it and uh, go back to those points of interest as you meet a point of interest go back to that point of interest and keep exploring it you know until you feel that you've kind of gotten everything that there is there for you and then uh, see where else that'll take you and you might even ask that question well i've kind of explored this to where i don't think there's a lot much you know not much there more where next where do i need to go next and uh, often the system will take you there where it is you need to go next or you just follow a, a lead that you have there it's, just, it's your intuition but you know, be open to do it all i wouldn't be afraid of any of it you know fear is a problem if you're, you're afraid well should i go there or maybe not go there and find out whether whether it's a it's a yes or a no Indeed, indeed, this uh, dream I had was an outcome of the question, what is next? So. Mm -hmm. Right. You will get answers. If you ask those kinds of questions and you're sincere and that you're not just on a carnival ride, you're not just you know looking for gee whiz, you really want to learn, to grow, to uh, become more, uh, um, you know, to be broader in your scope and uh, increase your, your decision space. If that's what you're doing, if this is about your growing up, yes, you ask those questions, what's next? What do I need to experience next? You know, as a, as a, as a, uh, an opportunity for me to learn and grow. And the system will almost always answer you with something. You know, you'll get something will start to nudge you then in one way or another. It has to be a cooperative, a cooperative effort between you and the larger consciousness system to, to, uh, to learn. 
It's not just that you're the student, okay, uh, larger conscious system, you know, tell me, you know, come and, come and teach me. You have to be involved in it. You know, it has to be your thing and you have to, uh, you have to want to learn. You have to ask the questions and make the effort. But if you do that, then lots of stuff will open up right in front of you. Then go, go explore it. See where it, see where it takes you. One thing will lead to another, to another. And before you know it, you're a different person. You have a whole different set of experiences that, that uh, help define you in a different way. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Tom. I, I think it's interesting how her professional workshop using Carl Jung's techniques um, came to the, showed them um, how their respective subjective realities differed. Um, I know you've said this many times and you've so I wonder if you would reiterate what is the fundamental reality that we are in? What are we dealing with? Well your fundamental reality is is consciousness. You know, that's the fundamental reality. And uh, Carl Jung was a very uh, he was very ahead of his time. He understood the larger system much better than most and uh, he had a, a reputation and a following that enabled him to to uh, teach and to spread his understanding, you know, pretty far and wide because he, he uh, had a, a platform from which he could speak. And he understood a whole lot. He understood that this nature of this reality was consciousness. He didn't necessarily say it in those terms, but he knew we were all connected. He knew that these, you know, these uh, archetypes exist because we create them. There are archetypes that uh, the conscious mind connects. Well, that archetype turns out to be like our group consciousness. At, at whatever level we congregate and organize, we, we kind of have a group consciousness and those what the, uh, his archetypes were. But he was a very uh, brilliant fellow. He said one thing that I thought was interesting. I've heard this quote from him, and that is, he said that when scientists seriously begin to study the non-physical, we will have begun to make progress. And that was a kind of a prediction of, of his. He realized that what happens in the non-physical is really more fundamental to us than the physical. He didn't see it in terms of virtual realities and larger consciousness systems and you know uh, people being netted and so on. He didn't use that kind of language or have those kind of concepts, but basically he understood it in his own way. And he was a very, uh, um, forward thinking person. Yeah, he knew everything was subjective, though, for sure. He knew yes. everything that he experienced, that everyone experienced was subjective. Yes, and indeed it is. Everybody's reality is unique to that individual. <laughs>